Thank you very much, and, and good evening, and welcome to SOAS. I am absolutely delighted uh, to open this year's inaugural lecture series with two presentations by very distinguished members of our Department of Politics and International Studies here at SOAS, Professor Phil Clark and Professor Dafit Fell. Tonight, as you just heard, we return for the first time since the pandemic um, to recognizing and celebrating uh, the scholarship of our professors. These lectures are, I think, a fitting tribute to the work of our department. The Department of Politics and International Studies at SOAS is one of the largest, with more than 1,200 undergraduate, postgraduate, and PhD students. In the UK's last research excellence framework, nearly 90% of the department's publications were judged world-leading or internationally excellent. And this week's QS Global Subject Rankings have placed the department number 18 in the world, and for research reputation, number four globally. I think tonight's presentations will continue to demonstrate the extraordinary and exceptional quality of the department's work. Our program this evening will begin with Professor Clark's presentation, followed by Professor Fells. Um, we're also extremely fortunate to have personal testimonials focused on our colleagues' work. Professor David Anderson will introduce Professor Clark, and then Professor Robert Ash will introduce Professor Fell. So in due course, I will introduce Professor Ash more fully, um, but for now, let me introduce Professor David Anderson. Professor Anderson is a professor of African history at the University of Warwick. Before this, he spent 10 years as a university lecturer and then a professor of African politics at the University of Oxford. But before that, he spent 11 years in the SOAS history department, serving as director of our Center for African Studies from 1998 to 2002. David is best known for his work on Mau Mau and British colonial violence in Kenya research that actually formed the basis for a very important Mau Mau reparations case in the UK High Court. And he was previously, in Nairobi, the director of the British Institute for Eastern Africa. Please join me in welcoming, welcoming Professor Anderson to give a testimonial for our colleague, uh, Professor Phil Clark. Professor Anderson. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, you've all learned that I can't hold down a job. <laughs> so, <clears throat> it's a real pleasure to be here, having worked at SOAS for so many years and having so many happy memories of being here and students here who I knew. So it's very good to come back and even more pleasurable to give the testimonial for one of my own PhD students, uh, Phil Clark. So let me say what I need to say. Um, Phil did his BA at Flinders and then came to Oxford to his graduate studies in 2002. From Flinders to Oxford is quite a long journey in every possible sense. But it was a transition that the young Phil Clark took in his very considerable stride. Although I think he was not entirely ready at the time for the journey that would follow. And that was a journey to Rwanda and to a profoundly impactful research career, working in very difficult places on awkward and sometimes dangerous topics. I think that was mostly my fault. <laughs> Let me explain. I'd only myself been in Oxford for a short while when this huge Australian fast bowler <laughs> darkened my door at the African Studies Centre. He was enormous. And he looked, as he was, a sportsman. And when he announced himself as a Rhodes Scholar, I thought, oh my God, not another one. Here we go. But this was no ordinary roadie. This man was far more serious than that. He came in anyway, sprawled himself across the sofa in my study, and told me he was doing a thesis in political theory, and proceeded to bore me for about half an hour about the contents of that thesis. Uh, it wasn't exciting. 
Like too many doctoral students at Oxford, I soon realised that Phil was then a refugee. He was wandering the university in search of a supervisor, trying to find someone who he could work with. Now, how he hit upon me, I'm not really sure. I think maybe he should tell that story later. But after a few more conversations over the next few weeks, I finally plucked up the courage to ask him why on earth he'd chosen to work in political theory in the first place, when clearly to me, that's not where his talents lay. I very quickly worked out that this was a man who could do fantastic field work, who was almost made for it, who had the skills and talents it required, some of them very special and very unusual. I wanted him not to do political theory, but to do the work I thought he was best at. And that would involve practical, applied field work, travelling around, talking to people, making sense of the world as he saw it. Those were the things I thought he was good at. And if ever a student made field work in Africa look easy, it was Phil Clark. And that's where it started, his next journey to Rwanda, to study Kachacha, and to engage directly with the issues of post-conflict reconstruction and reconciliation. I remember the rather incongruous look on his face when I first said to him, why don't you just go and talk to them? And he said, well, I don't know them. Go and ask. <laughs> and that is just what he did. And with almost no contacts, almost no connections initially, he built his own world around this research. That's a profoundly difficult thing to do. But again, he had the skills and talents to do it. At Oxford also, when he came back from his fieldwork and was writing up his thesis, he very quickly learned how to milk the institutional cow, how to get resources from Oxford to work for him and the people he worked with. He was able to set up there the Oxford Transitional Justice Research Group. And I think we initially gave you a few quid to get you started from African Studies budget. I probably shouldn't have done that, but I hope no one's listening from, from, from Oxford. Um, but the point is that the Oxford Transitional Justice Research Network has become a really big thing. It was really important at the time. It gave focus and a degree of consensus to work on transitional justice that was then just emerging. And 16 years later, it's still going, still functioning. So that was academic leadership of a profound kind, the kind you don't often see in someone who's just freshly out of a PhD. So I think, um, I think that marked Phil out as someone who might well be going quite far. And that was indeed to be Phil's trademark. High academic quality combined with engagement and real impact. Nothing he's done has ever been purely academic. All of it has a connection to people and their lives and an impact on those lives. But the books are truly outstanding. And as a Cambridge University Press editor, I'm very proud that they're both published. The, both, the ones that I like the most are both published by CUP. The Gachacha Courts, Post-Genocide Justice and Reconciliation, Justice Without Lawyers, came out in 2010. And it remains to this day the most unique and path-breaking study of the genocide. Critical reading for anyone who wants to understand what happened in Rwanda and in fact, only this Monday, I was teaching it to my students at Warwick. The other book that's made a real impact, I think, is Distant Justice on the ICC. This is what you might call a Marmite book. Not everyone likes what Phil has to say. But the point of that book is that it speaks truth to power. You're not meant to like everything that's in it. It's an uncomfortable and difficult topic. And he handles that so well. Everything he's done since then has gone beyond the academic. His work on Uganda, Congo, Burundi, South Sudan, all of it's been cutting edge in applied practical research. I'd also like to highlight, I think, the terrific work he did with the UN Office for the High Commissioner of Human Rights on popular perceptions of transitional justice and peace building in northern Uganda. And on a recent visit to northern Uganda, I met people there who recalled Phil from that research, talked about the impact it made, talked about what they'd done, so that, again, I think was a powerful piece of work. But his work has also supported scholarship and research in Rwanda and the wider region in very significant ways that are also highly unusual. Since 2014, 
Phil has been energetically involved in a programme to support Rwandan researchers. It is supported by the UK's Foreign Office, FCDO as we must now call it, as well as CEDA in Stockholm. And it's hosted by the Aegis Trust, the wonderful Aegis Trust. And this programme has been astonishingly successful in stimulating local researchers and cultivating academics in Kigali and beyond. Those of you who read the magazine Nature will know that this programme was highlighted in the magazine editorial earlier this month on 11th of April, along with a five-page feature that reflected on Rwanda's progress 30 years after the genocide. So the network of Rwandan researchers that Phil's work has done so much to nurture and sustain, in doing that work, he's also, also been supported by his partner, Nikki Palmer, who also happens to be an academic work working in this same field. I wonder what they talk about over dinner. <laughs> and it's really important that I think Phil has had that support. And even as, uh, uh, at Oxford, uh, Nicky was there beside him, assisting with what he was doing. And I think that's also a, a part of the character of the work he does. The family matters. They are part of this story as well. So the continuities in Phil's work over these years are very strong. And he's remained very firmly focused on the same key set of research questions. He's been engaged with a growing assembly of local research partners in the region, and he's continued to publish a series of high-quality and impactful articles, books, and working papers, exactly as a senior professor should. And, of course, this month marks the 30th anniversary of the Rwandan genocide. And I was recalling uh, yesterday to my own students um, arriving in Kampala in, I think it was around the 16th or 17th of April, 1994, having come up from South Africa and flying in over the lake that afternoon and noticing there were no fishing boats on the lake. And then noticing what I first thought were lobster pots bobbing in the water. As I landed off the plane, I thought, well, those can't be lobsters. There's no lobsters in Lake Victoria. And of course, the next morning when I went down to the lake shore and spoke with a fisherman, I discovered the horrid truth. Those were bodies that had come down the Kagera River and were in the lake and were stopping the fishermen from going out. So Rwanda had a profound effect on all of us who witnessed it. And I tell that story at the end of this because I want to emphasise it's not an easy topic to research. It's immensely challenging. Among the 65 PhD students I've supervised in these last 43 years, Phil is the only one who worked on Rwanda. He's not the only one who asked to come and work with me who worked on Rwanda. But he's the only one I accepted. Didn't make a bad choice, did I? Thank you. How do you follow that? I'm going to keep this hat on for about six seconds. It doesn't fit. <laughs> if the cap doesn't fit, that raises some questions, perhaps about my fitness for this, uh, this professorship. But uh, I've got my boys here, Angus, Lockie and Joel, whose main reason for being here tonight is to see Daddy in a funny gown and a funny hat. So you've seen it, boys, and now it's coming off, because otherwise it's going to fall off. And these lights are very bright, so we're going to need some water here. Duffy, I'm going to pour for you as well. I'm going to look after your departmental colleagues. <laughs> I'm glad I could finally do this um, after five years of the chance to come and, and give an inaugural lecture. I'd like to really thank some of the people behind the scenes um, who've made this whole series possible. So. Laura Hammond, who couldn't be here tonight because she's unwell. Uh, Carolyn and Nick, who've done a huge amount of work uh, to facilitate all of this. It's customary, but it's also right at the start of these inaugural lectures to thank the people who've helped you along the journey to this point. Um, I, I owe an enormous amount uh, to Dave, who I think has been incredibly modest in terms of talking about his contribution uh, to my journey. One of my great strokes of luck in my career uh, was to convince Dave over a few beers that it would be a good idea to take me on as a PhD 
supervisor. I, I should also uh, thank Henry Shu, who came on as a, a co-supervisor for my PhD. Henry couldn't be here uh, tonight. Um, I'm delighted to share this event this evening too with my good friend and colleague, uh, Duffid Fell. Very much looking forward to hearing you speak about Taiwan in, in just a moment, Duffid. I know my, my mum, my brothers and various family members will be watching this on YouTube, so I need to give them a shout out. And as I think has already been mentioned, uh, my immediate family are right here in the second row, Nikki, Angus, Lockie and Joel. And uh, I think it was fantastic, Dave, that you highlighted the importance of, of family in terms of academic work. In our case, because both of us work on Rwanda, we do family field work, um, which I will talk about in just a moment. I have lots of current and former students in the room tonight, lots of friends from different walks of life. I'm particularly grateful to Matt Nelson and the politics department. It's such a fantastic department, as Matt has already mentioned, a real uh, intellectual home and a real social home for me over the last uh, 14 years. I'm very grateful to all of my departmental colleagues. I should also mention that there are seven members here tonight of the London Fields Cricket Club, um, another, another intellectual home for me in a, in a different sense. All I can say is please guys don't drink too much at the reception afterwards. We have a pretty big game on the weekend. <laughs> Let's talk about Rwanda. That's what we're really here to talk about tonight. A, a perplexing but uh, endlessly enthralling country uh, that I have tried to in my very small way, understand over the last 20 years or more. As Dave mentioned, this month marks the 30th anniversary of the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. I think that 30 years is a very helpful juncture to be able to take stock of where Rwanda has come from and perhaps to think about where the country might be heading. Of course, the backdrop to tonight's discussion is also this endless debate about Rwanda here in the UK. It's been very peculiar as a Rwanda specialist, working on a country that has had no coverage in the British press uh, for probably the first 15 or 20 years after the genocide, uh, to now see Rwanda on the front page of every British newspaper. I'm hoping that we can perhaps uh, illuminate some aspects of Rwanda that have not been uh, illuminated in the British press coverage. Um, the lecture this evening draws on a book that I've got coming out uh, with Hearst. Next year, I know that Stephanie Kitchen, uh, my very patient editor, is in the audience this evening. Stephanie, I promise you the manuscript is on its way. <laughs> but thank you for your patience. The book basically focuses on how everyday Rwandans have experienced uh, the country's post-genocide recovery under the ruling party, the Rwandan Patriotic Front, the RPF, um, the party that captured power in Rwanda in 1994 and has ruled Rwanda ever since. And in particular, the book focuses on the importance of socioeconomic welfare to reconciliation. A lot of my previous work has been on criminal justice. Uh, it's been on truth-telling and how that connects to reconciliation. I'm now looking at, at socioeconomic issues um, and welfare in particular. And as Dave's alluded to, this is based on fieldwork that I've been conducting almost every year in Rwanda since 2003, um, in, including during COVID. I've conducted about 2,000 interviews now with everyday Rwandans, and a lot of those are longitudinal interviews. So I go back to the same places and talk to the, the same people, uh, in some cases right across that full 21-year time span. The broad argument of the book and of the lecture this evening is that I think that Rwanda is much more complex than it's depicted in a lot of the literature. A lot of the academic literature on Rwanda, I think, is incredibly black and white and, and covers over a lot of the complexities um, that, 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 that I see in the country. Um, the country's made enormous strides since the genocide against the Tutsi in 1994. Perhaps the most remarkable achievement of the country is, is visible when you go to Rwanda's hills. And I think this is often skimmed over in a lot of the commentary that in the aftermath of the genocide, the, the country now, especially in the countryside, uh, sees very stable, uh, very productive rural communities, which is where 83% of the population lives. And I think that reality in alone is against all the odds, particularly when you think that this is in the aftermath of a very intimate genocide in 1994. 800,000 people, mostly Tutsi, killed, and mostly killed by their Hutu neighbours, killed by people that they had grown up with, that they knew incredibly well. And you can imagine all of the tensions and all of the trauma that that entails. But the gains of the country also come in the midst of a very intimate post-genocide situation, because one of the things that 
characterises Rwanda today is that hundreds of thousands of genocide perpetrators are back living side by side with genocide survivors in the very same communities where they committed crimes in 1994. And all of this is happening in Africa's most densely populated country. So the stability that rural Rwanda in particular faces uh, was by no means guaranteed, and, and I think we need to recognise that up front. Most commentators predicted, especially in the 1990s, that Rwanda would experience some kind of reignition of mass violence, and that hasn't happened. And I think that forces us to, to think about why. All of these benefits, all of these gains, though, have happened in a very particular political context. This is a context characterised by major government control. It's a tiny state, but it's a very powerful state, which produces a certain amount of fear amongst everyday Rwandans. But the dominant perspective that my respondents articulate to me and have done over the last 20 years is not so much fear, but a sense of pressure a sense of pressure to perform according to a very particular vision of what it means to be a good Rwandan citizen. It's a highly intrusive state, but overall it's, it, it, it's quite a predictable state. There is not the kind of arbitrary repression. There is not the predatory repression that we see in the rest of the region. The country is characterised by very low government corruption, Citizens feel the weight of the state and they chafe against it, but they also find the government quite predictable, which gives citizens at least a chance of being able to manoeuvre around the state, of course, within certain limits. And the idea that I try to articulate in this book coming out next year is that I think in a very uneasy, in a very unpredictable way, the country has achieved a sense of social equilibrium. And I won't go into all of the theory tonight. I mean, Dave's already warned against, you know... <laughs> I think, I think it's a huge benefit to political theorists that you did what you did. Whether, whether the Great Lakes region has benefited, but I can assure you that political theorists have benefited from you diverting me into a different territory. So I'm not, I'm not going to go too much into the theory tonight. But I use this concept in the book of social equilibrium rather than two concepts that are more common in the literature, social contract or political settlement, because I think social equilibrium gives us a wider sense of actors and interests that... The state and citizens are forever trying to balance. I argue in the book that I think that Rwanda has achieved a certain sense of social equilibrium 30 years after the genocide, but that equilibrium is being challenged by several factors that I'll talk about in just a moment. So to try to show these dynamics, I, I first want to zoom in on a very specific story, and then I want to zoom out to the national level. And I guess in my research, that's something I'm always trying to do. I'm very interested in individual stories, but I want to know where they fit. Because if your big picture about Rwanda doesn't mesh with the reality of individuals, you've, you've got a problem in your analysis. But the same is vice versa. If you're telling a story about an individual, but it doesn't really mesh with what's going on at the macro level, you, you've also got a problem. So this is an attempt, I guess, to try to do micro and macro analysis. So to do the micro bit, let me tell you about one particular convicted genocide perpetrator who, for the purposes of this presentation, I'll call Alphonse. Uh, I first met Alphonse in 2003 when I was a PhD student. He was 36 then, he's, he's now 57. And I've visited Alphonse almost every year since then. We've built a friendship of quite considerable trust over that time. He's now married, he's got four kids, we... We often sit together in his house and he says to me, he says, you know, we met when we were young men. He says, we're not young anymore. <laughs> my kids now visit his home. Um, my three boys have been to Alphonse's home several times. He lives in a tiny village down near the Burundian border. He's very friendly. He's very chatty. One of the things that comes up in our interviews all the time is he, he keeps getting interrupted. People from the neighbourhood keep coming by and knocking on his door, asking for help and, and advice. And sometimes I have to remind myself that Alphonse killed four people during the genocide against the Tutsi in 1994. To complicate his situation, he's not only a genocide perpetrator, but he's also a victim of violence in 1994, insofar as the RPF, the party that had captured power in July of 94, killed Alphonse's father and killed one of his brothers in revenge attacks after the genocide. So it's not surprising that Alphonse is very critical of the RPF. 
He has good reason to. But he also expresses surprise at what has happened in his own life uh, since I met him in 2003. He expresses a real sense of surprise that as a genocide perpetrator, he was treated quite leniently. He expected quite substantial reprisals from the state and from genocide survivors um, because of what he had done. He's also surprised at the provision that he's experienced uh, from the Rwandan state, especially in terms of welfare that has given him health care and uh, helped him pay the school fees for his kids. His kids are all healthy and they're all in school and Alphonse, because of this government help, has been able to fix up his house. The big signifiers of this in his village is that he has a concrete floor, he's got metal frames around the door uh, and his windows, and he's just recently been able to connect the house to the village electricity line. These are major developments in his household. And he certainly didn't think that any of these things would be possible when, when I first met him. He's also, I think, probably to his surprise more than anyone's, been elected as a local government official in the village, and he's now the head of the sector level uh, welfare committee. So he's, he's basically become a member of the state, the same state uh, that, that killed his father and killed his brother. From a research point of view, it's extremely useful to have him on the welfare committee, because I'm writing a book on Rwanda's welfare system, so I've got my man, Alphonse, on the inside, giving me insights into how the system works. He also says, and I can see it in his day-to-day -day interactions, that he has much better relations with genocide survivors than he had uh, when, when he first came back to that community in 2003. And I talk to genocide survivors in his community a lot, and I watch the interactions between him and those people. We do spend quite a lot of time in the village bar drinking sorghum beer. Um, it's quite potent. Um, I think we need a session in our theory and methods training about how to deal with, uh, with such things, but it's been quite useful uh, in terms of getting conversations in Alphonse's village going. None of this seemed likely in his life 21 years ago. So why is that? What has made the life of a genocide perpetrator like Alphonse possible today? How does he now have a sense of security, a sense of stability? How does he have not only better relations with genocide survivors, but a much broader sense of optimism uh, about where his family, family's life is going. When I talk to Alphonse about this, he talks about two processes in particular. There are lots of processes, but for the sake of brevity tonight, let me talk about two. The first is Gachacha, which Dave's already mentioned. It was the subject of my first book. Gachacha was basically a system of 12,000 courts between 2002 and 2012 that prosecuted 400,000 genocide suspects village by village across the country. It's the, the most ambitious transitional justice experiment that any country has ever attempted. And one of the crucial things about Gachacha, which Alphonse experienced firsthand, was that it opened up a community dialogue about the causes of the genocide and its impact. And one of the things that I, I talk about in the book is that Alphonse lives very close to the mother of three of the people, three of the four people that he killed in 1994. They, in fact, work on the same plot of land. But for years, they had never spoken about his crimes and their effects. And it was only when they went to Gachacha that that conversation started to open up and that he feels that he has had a much more productive relationship um, with that woman um, who I call in the book Mutateli. I, I changed the names of, of all of these people. So that, that dialogue that Gachacha enabled was very, very important. The process also reduced community suspicions about who had, was responsible for those acts of intimate violence and, and those who were not. Gachacha also used very creative forms of criminal sentencing, including for Alphonse himself. It didn't tend to send people back to jail. Only a tiny uh, number of people were sent to prison after Gachacha. Most did community service, and, and Alphonse did about a year's community service. It wasn't just punishment for punishment's sake. There was uh, a sense of needing to, to provide some material benefit to genocide survivors through this kind of sentencing. And all of this, if you add it up, is crucial for the way that Alphonse has been able to reintegrate back onto his particular hill. The second process is called Ubudehe, U-B-U-D-E-H-E. -E. It's 
basically the umbrella term for Rwanda's welfare system. In a technical sense, what Ubedehe is, is communities come together and they put every household in the community into welfare categories, depending on the perceived socioeconomic needs of those households. They, these open-air meetings are actually very similar to the Gachacha trials in many ways. They all happen sort of out uh, in the village courtyard and where, where everybody can participate. And it's on the basis of these welfare categories that are decided by local communities that then a very wide array of welfare benefits then accrue to Rwandan citizens. And one of the things that is particularly loaded during Ubedehe meetings is what kind of healthcare subsidies are you going to get? So there's compulsory health insurance uh, in Rwanda. Everybody has to have it, but it's heavily subsidised by the state. But it's subsidised at different levels depending on the Ubedehe category that you're put in. One of the outcomes of the healthcare system facilitated by Ubedehe is that Rwanda cut its child mortality rate by 70% in the first 10 years of Ubedehe. So it had, it had a really major impact. But one of the things that I also talk about in the book is not just how welfare gets delivered through Ubudehe, but the way that inadvertently I think it has created a new class system in the country. Everybody knows their Ubudehe categories. You go anywhere in the country, mention Ubudehe, people will say, I'm category one, I'm category two, he's a category three, he shouldn't be a three, he should be a two. Everybody knows where they are in the system. It's a very stratified System And one of the interesting questions, I think, in Rwanda is how much class may, over time, come to supersede ethnicity as one, is one of the crucial uh, social fissures uh, in, in, in the country. But maybe this is the most important thing about Ubedehe, is that it has been delivered, welfare has been delivered equally across the ethnic divide in a way that has surprised Alphonse and most of my Hutu respondents. Most of my Hutu respondents will say they expected the RPF, dominated by Tutsi, to deliver welfare in the way that the two previous Hutu regimes had, under Kayabanda and under Habyarimana, where there was a high degree of ethnic favouritism, and it simply hasn't happened in the Rwandan case. And this, I think, is crucial for reconciliation, and I think, I mean, this is a bit of a side note, but a country like South Africa could learn a lot from this very extensive use of socioeconomic welfare that we see in Rwanda. South Africa undoubtedly much more democratic than Rwanda, but finds that reconciliation is undercut by endemic inequality. And Rwanda, I think, has, much, has made much greater strides in terms of tackling socio socioeconomic inequality, and therefore, I think, is much further along the pathway of, of reconciliation. So, Alphonse tells me this, and many of my respondents talk about it at length. It's the powerful combination of these two processes. Gachacha enabled this direct village-by-village -village reckon, uh, reckoning with the past. Ubedehe started to tackle some of the structural and the socioeconomic drivers of mass violence, and it's the combination of these two things that I think is particularly powerful. So the result of all of this is a sense of communities, especially in the countryside, starting to settle down. My respondents use various synonyms for this idea that after the tumult of the genocide and its immediate aftermath, people now experience overall a sense of physical and socioeconomic stability. And a big change that I see in many of my respondents, especially those that I've been interviewing every single year over these 21 years, is their ability to plan. People talk about the future. We can sit down as a household and we can say, we're going to do X, Y, and Z. We're going to save. We're going to build a concrete floor. 10, 15 years ago, that wasn't happening so much. It's, it's, it's happening now. There's also a real belief that people's kids will do better than, than they did. But there are major fragilities in this situation. And I think we need to, we need to talk about this. I've talked a lot about the benefits, the gains that I think Rwanda has made, but there are some serious vulnerabilities in this system too. And I would identify at the moment the major vulnerability that Rwanda experiences is a growing sense of reduced government provision. And this is most acute in Kigali amongst the <coughs> urban poor. It's a feeling that's been building for a while. When I was researching for this latest book uh, in 
2019, the Ubudehe categories were changed. Now, I won't sort of bore you with all of the... That's very good. Lucky you've got a view. <laughs> Ubudehe categories changing is very important, young man. As you know, because we talk about it around the table. <laughs> The Ubudehe categories used to represent what people actually had. It was how they were perceived in the community. What are your assets? What is your current reality? In 2019, the government changed the Ubudehe categories to represent people's potential. They became aspirational. Suddenly, the technical language of graduation was on everyone's lips. I would go to the farthest flung village and talk about Ubudehe. People said, government's told us we have to graduate. It's extraordinary how this kind of language get, gets imbibed gets imbibed on the hills. But the crucial thing that was coming out in 2019, especially in Kigali, was that the reason for the Ubadehe recategorization was to move people into the higher categories that accrued fewer welfare benefits, decreasing the benefits given to those uh, at the lower level. So there was a very strong sense of people being given less. But that feeling of state abandonment especially from the welfare space, was exacerbated during COVID. Not so much in the countryside, because people could continue to farm. Most communities in rural Rwanda had, had two good harvests leading into the pandemic. People had enough to eat. It wasn't like that in Kigali. And we as a family got locked down for about five months. I spent much more time in our neighbourhood in Kigali than I would have spent uh, ordinarily. When, when the guidelines were lifted, you could get back out to the rural areas. But for a long time, we were, we were, we were stuck in Kigali, and what characterised the urban situation during the pandemic was massive food insecurity. Very limited government food distribution and extensive begging, which there is a very deep cultural opposition to in Rwanda. But people were so desperate, so hungry, that, that begging in the city was, was very, very common. And so this growing sense of state abandonment was compounded, especially amongst the urban poor. Now, what's driving this government retreat from the welfare space. Given how extensive Ubudehe has been for so long, what is driving this shift? There are two factors, and let me summarise them, because I can see Matt getting edgy in the front row. He says, we've been told to stick to the schedule, Clark, and I will, in my own sort of way. Um, two factors, let me summarise them. The first one is a neoliberal shift within the RPF itself. This party is changing. The personnel within the party is changing out of sight. And Kagami, in particular, has changed the guard. He has removed a lot of the old guard and he's replaced them with these young, usually well-educated technocrats. He likes them because they tend to challenge him a lot less and they're much less influenced by direct experiences of the genocide. When, when I first started working in Rwanda and was sort of working in the wider region. People would talk about, I mean, especially leaders in the region would talk about the RPF in the, in, with a sense of awe. This was a powerhouse party. You know, you think of some of the names, those of you who are familiar with Central Africa, James Kabarebi, Patrick Karagaya, Patrick Mazimpaka, Alois Nyumba, Fatuma Ndengiza, the Johnston Basinje, who we happen to have with us this evening, current High Commissioner for Rwanda. You know, this was a, there was a sense of real intellect, real influence, real creativity in, in the party and a real transformative agenda. These were the architects of processes like Gachacha and Ubedehe. But there's a sense, I think, at the moment of that agenda being diluted. Many of that old guard no longer hold their positions in power. Some of them have died or, or been killed. Others have simply been uh, removed from their positions. There's a change in the way that the RPF operates. And it's heading down a, a, a much stingier neoliberal line. The second key factor that drives this change in the welfare space is international. Because Rwanda is subject to the same pressures as all other African states. And it's a country at the moment coming out of the pandemic that is experiencing structural adjustment by stealth. And Rwanda's not alone in this sense. So many African states are feeling the increased pressure of the IMF, the World Bank, uh, uh, bilateral and multilateral donors, and the big pressure especially from the IMF and the World Bank, on Rwanda, has been to reduce welfare spending. And the RPF kept that at bay for a long time. They're no longer keeping it at bay. And one of the ways that this manifests at the moment, and I actually think it's a monstrous mistake, is Rwanda is about to replace Ubudehe and these community-driven categorizations 
with a social registry that is now delivered by the technocrats in Kigali. It's going to lose any of that sense of communities themselves deciding who needs what, who the most vulnerable in the community are. One of the crucial reasons I think that we've seen welfare delivered equally across the ethnic divide is because communities have, have, have demanded it. They have dictated it. And there is a danger, I think, of losing that with this social registry uh, that is being pushed especially by the IMF and the World Bank. It also means that Rwanda is now considering a large-scale program of cash transfers. And there's already a pilot study being done by Rory Stewart and Give Directly. Again, this is happening in lots of African states. Everybody's very excited about cash transfers. If we can just put cash in households' hands, people will decide on their own terms how to spend that money. That is seen increasingly as the answer to welfare. The danger, I think, in Rwanda, and it's very unclear which way this is going to go, are these cash transfers a supplement or a supplant to the existing welfare system? Is this the idea of how welfare gets delivered in the future, that you stop subsidising healthcare and education and all the other things that the RPF has done, and then you just dump massive amounts of cash uh, in these communities on the hills. There's very little academic evidence about how cash transfers work in post-conflict societies. And the evidence that is there tends to be quantitative only. There are not enough political scientists, sociologists, anthropologists, historians going out and saying, what happens when you dump this cash in those households? And, and how does this fit in a longer history of how people expect welfare to be delivered? It can be very vulnerable, it can be very unpredictable, and we just don't know enough. But the RPF, under this international pressure, is thinking very strongly about cash transfers as the answer, and I have some concerns about that. So to wrap things up, I think the developments that we see at the moment pose a significant risk to the post-genocide social equilibrium that... Rwanda has so assiduously pursued over the last 30 years. The RPF will remain in power for the foreseeable, there's no doubt about that. And so the extent of state control will remain basically the same. The sense of societal balance, I think, requires the RPF then to ensure that the provision side, the welfare side, remains constant and that it keeps a very close eye on this ethnic equalisation of, of welfare. The RPF, I think, also has to think very seriously about how it decreases that societal pressure. How does it start to decrease that sense of government control, especially given the demands of a new post-genocide generation? More than 70% of Rwandans are aged under 30, and so they don't have a direct experience of the violence. And I see Kiralee Pels and others here who, who work on young people in in Rwanda and who, who know this topic better, better than I do. That generation that didn't experience the genocide directly has very different views on what a reasonable level of government control looks like. If you experience the violence firsthand, if you remember it like it was yesterday, you perhaps will, you, you will accept a certain amount of government intrusion for the sake of, of security. But if, if you're of the post-94 generation, and I see this in my interviews, your views undoubtedly are different. So the RPF and Rwanda is at a crossroads. Really significant choices have to be made now. The, the country has come so far. Nobody could have anticipated how far Rwanda would come, especially in terms of welfare and reconciliation since 94. And I, and I think the achievements of the country have to be, have to be recognised in those very stark terms. But there are forces and dynamics at play that potentially undercut some of those crucial gains. And so the RPF has critical decisions to make to shore up the achievements of the last 30 years um, and to prepare for some pretty major challenges ahead. Thank you. Now, Dufford and I had negotiated for a bit of a Q&A, but I've spoken for too long, so I'm going to forego mine and I'm going, to, I'm going to hand back to Matt. So it would be greedy, I think, to go on. So I'm going to hand back to you, Matt. Thanks. Thank you so much, Phil, for that incredible uh, introduction to your, to your work. Um, I think many of us are familiar with that, that work, and it, it's great to be reminded of where, where it's been and where it's going, where it's going next. It, it is now my privilege, however, to, to welcome Professor Robert Ash. 
uh, to give a testimonial for Professor Daphit Fell. Professor Ash is Emeritus Professor of Economics um, and an associate of the SOAS China Institute. Um, he has nearly 60 years of distinguished history at SOAS, joining as a student of Chinese in the 1960s um, before completing his MA and then his PhD. Professor Ash was then a professor of economics uh, in the SOAS Economics Department and the Center for Financial and Management Studies, as well as the founding director in 1999 of our Taiwan Studies Program. His research focuses on economic and social development in China, including food security, rural development, population and migration, employment, and living standards. You see the link. As well as agricultural development in post-1949 Taiwan. Please join me in welcoming Professor Ash to give a testimonial for Professor Daphit Fell. Well, it's very nice to be back in this um, building, which, as Matt said, I know quite well. <laughs> uh, but the greatest pleasure, of course, is to be here this evening and to have been invited to say a few words about Professor David Fell is really one of the greatest pleasures to come my way in a long time. Uh, I first came to know David, as it were, properly in about 2003 when he was appointed to a three-year postdoctoral fellowship uh, attached to what was then a relatively new SOAS Taiwan program. And thereafter, for, I guess, uh, almost 20 years, maybe a little bit more than 20 years, we worked very closely. I was trying to think, how do we describe ourselves? Well, a kind of maybe duumvirate directing um, that program. The vision for the development of Taiwan studies that we were trying to realize was, I really think it was a very shared one, and certainly, I look back on those uh, years of collaboration as an extremely happy uh, experience. But to try to capture, to try to capture David, and try to try to capture his academic achievements within five minutes, uh, that's way beyond my capabilities. Um, the achievements extend in many directions. Of course, research. Of course, writing, publication, teaching. I would add also uh, to that list very effectively communicating his insights to a wide and a very diverse <coughs> external audience. But of course, above all, he enjoys a global reputation, not just as the driving force behind the development of Taiwan studies here at SOAS, but really as someone who has uh, helped to shape the entire field uh, much more widely throughout Europe, certainly, but I think one can say throughout the world. And that reputation rests and reflects his academic impact, but also, and there are many in this audience tonight who would attest to this, his personal impact through engagement with, of course, many many scholars, many international scholars, but also many other constituencies. David, as, though, as, the, uh, as, uh, as those who know him will know, has an extremely fertile and creative mind. And that, allied to his uh, enthusiasm, uh, enthusiasm and quite indescribable energy, uh, have been key to the remarkable trajectory that the Taiwan Studies program has followed in the last quarter of a century now. From today's perspective, it seems kind of astonishing that back in the 1990s, the end of the 1990s, when the program was set up, Taiwan really didn't feature at all as part of the curriculum here at SOAS, for that matter, at any other British university or any other European university. But at the heart of our Taiwan program was a determination to, as it were, examine uh, Taiwan on its, on its own terms. And that meant embracing its history, 
uh, looking at the much more recent transformation of its political and economic and social systems and its cultural development. David would, I know, say that the success with which those goals have been fulfilled um, really reflects a team effort. And there's no doubt that there's certainly a lot of truth in that. But what I want to say is that the greater truth by far is that that success owes most to his efforts. He really is the one, if one has to identify a person, he is the one who has been instrumental in making SOAS what it is, which is the world center of, of Taiwan studies. He has been the driver of its uniquely comprehensive teaching program, including the establishment of the only MA in Taiwan studies that exists in the English-speaking world. And it's his energy in more recent years that have made so as the focal point of publications on Taiwan by creating a dedicated journal of Taiwan studies and establishing a book series on Taiwan, of which he happens to be the series editor. And meanwhile, the uh, continued vibrancy of the SOAS program is very evident in the extraordinary range of topics that have been addressed in seminars and workshops, and international conferences, and not least the lecture series plural, that run weekly through every academic year. And then there is the wider, if you like, geographical impact of David's efforts. Um, if I can claim as my brainchild the idea of trying to foster a community of interest among European specialists on Taiwan by creating a Europe-wide institutional network, he was the one who did the really hard work in bringing into being the European Association of Taiwan Studies, which incidentally, a few weeks ago, held in Vienna this year, its 21st, imagine that, 21st, I think, I think didn't even fail to hold a conference during COVID, as I recall. Anyway, 21st annual conference. And that Association of Taiwan Studies, as well as the Taiwan Summer School, another of his initiatives, has been influential in promoting and disseminating the research and insights of scholars working on Taiwan throughout Europe, and again, more, more widely, further afield. He is also the single author of, I think it's five monographs, and I don't include a larger number of edited and co-edited books, as well, of course, of numerous articles and book chapters. His publications are very wide-ranging, but I would particularly highlight his work, groundbreaking work, on Taiwan's political parties and its electoral politics. And we're going to get a taste of that in a moment when he delivers his lecture. If this very brief rehearsal of his involvement in Taiwan studies leaves you breathless, as well it might, it perhaps will also explain why I often think of and see Taiwan, uh, see, not Taiwan, see uh, David as a force of nature. He is truly a force of nature. Uh, and I am not the only one here who would admit occasionally to feeling it necessary to try to curb <laughs> his enthusiasm. But we all learn that such attempts are doomed to inevitable failure. <laughs> We're never successful. Regardless of objective constraints, on he plows. And before long, we find ourselves, of course, carried along in the slipstream of his ideas and his passion and his energy and his enthusiasm. So it is a great privilege to have had this opportunity to salute David's remarkable academic achievements, and I do so with enormous pleasure. Can I now invite you to come up here and present your lecture. The title of it is Alternative Politics in Taiwan, The Birth of Taiwan's Green Party. Thank you.
I'm going to follow um, <laughs> Phil's precedent here. Okay, so it's, um, I'm really delighted to, uh, to be here to have this chance to uh, share my uh, Taiwan Green Party's um, uh, research. Uh, this is almost the 50th, 50th time I've spoken on this project. Um, but um, this time I'm going to do something a little bit different and just focus narrowly on about eight weeks of the, uh, the party's uh, almost 30 years um, uh, history. Um, and that was one of the things that was really exciting um, for me over the last week or so. I've been going back and listening again to the interview transcripts, going back to see the, um, uh, the media uh, reports uh, from that, those, those eight weeks. Um, and Phil's given us a sense of uh, how valuable field work is for us. It's, it's often the thing that kind of uh, really motivates us. Um, you will also notice I've slightly changed the, um, the title, um, and I'll explain uh, later on why I've, I've um, changed to the birth of Taiwan's Green Party, not uh, Asia's first uh, Green um, uh, Party. So I'm going to try and do a few things in today's um, 20 minutes uh, or, or so. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, how this project um, uh, got started. Um, I'll talk about how the Green Party itself was, was formed, um, and I'll talk a little bit about its first election, which occurs uh, just a few weeks after the party is uh, established. Um, and I'm going to try and squeeze in um, some words of, uh, of thanks um, uh, towards the uh, end. A few people, names I'll mention uh, over the way will be Peng Yongwen, who you see the cartoon of, uh, Ju Law and Yuan Ru. But there will be others that I'll also thank um, on, the, uh, on the way. So, um, it's a special moment for me to be standing here almost uh, 25 years after I first arrived at SOAS as a, uh, a PhD student to, to, um, uh, to, to the Department of, of Politics and International Studies. To do a PhD with Professor Julia uh, Strauss. Um, and this also kind of tells me um, just how time has, has flown uh, by. When I started working with uh, Julia, she was a junior academic. I was her first ever um, uh, PhD student. Uh, and then this year is the year that she's doing her final teaching um, at, um, uh, at SOAS. Um, and this is from her inaugural le lecture in 2014. So for the PhD, uh, I looked at Taiwan's mainstream parties, uh, and I focused on the development of, of party politics in Taiwan uh, for the first decade of multi-party politics, so through from 1991 to uh, 2001. And that led to my first book, Party Politics uh, in, uh, in Taiwan. Uh, I went back to take a look at that book and I found there was no mention at all of the political party that I, I cover um, in my most uh, recent uh, book. But there is a degree of, of continuity, uh, particularly in some of the concepts such as party change um, in these two, uh, two books. Uh, I wanted to try and find a couple of pictures of my time as a student uh, at, at SOAS. Uh, and here we have me arriving uh, from my year of field work in the um, um, uh, late 2000. Um, and then we have my uh, graduation uh, ceremony. Um, and uh, that also gives you a sense of how uh, the area has changed. So this is taken in the Brunswick Centre, which looked like a kind of a very desolate um, <laughs> uh, place. It's, it's hard to recognise um, uh, today. Uh, but of course, my interest in Taiwan's uh, party politics and civil society um, goes back um, much further to my days as a, um, a student in, um, in, in Leeds University. Uh, and it's really great to see quite a few of my uh, Leeds uh, era classmates here, 30 uh, plus years uh, later. Being in, in Taiwan uh, that year, between 1989 and 1990, um, had a real transformative effect uh, on me. Uh, it meant that I was in Taiwan the first year that there was a multi-party uh, election. And you, you see these two flags uh, feature in, the, in my first um, book. But I was also there at the time of Taiwan's um, sunflower, oh no, wild lily student pro-democracy uh, movement. Um, and here you see the, the scene of the students uh, about to leave the square. Um, and if you look very carefully, you can see one of the wild lily uh, petals um, uh, there. Um, and um, this uh, student pro-democracy movement um, 
also has an impact on, on the Green Party's book. Many of the people that feature in the book had their first experience of uh, protest activism um, as first or second year uh, university students. Um, they're known as the Wild Lily uh, generation, and um, this was quite an important experience for them. So how did I um, end up writing a book on something that seemed very marginal to me uh, early in my academic uh, career? Um, the first time I wrote about Taiwan's Green Parties was in a paper I, I, I published in 2005 on Taiwan's small parties. But I just had a few very brief paragraphs uh, on the uh, Taiwan uh, Green Party. And the answer to the puzzle, I think, is related to um, the interactive um, uh, nature of teaching at SOAS. Um, I think uh, SOAS can be a hard university both to study at and to work at. Um, it often can be quite a frustrating place. I think if you've worked at SOAS, I think you know what I, I mean. But um, one of the things I, I think keeps a lot of us here is the students. Um, I often feel that um, they, uh, we learn, as teachers, we learn more from them than we, we teach um, uh, them through office hours, through um, our uh, interactive um, uh, tutorials. Um, and my Green Party's book was an example of, of the way that students uh, inf can influence uh, us. And in this case, the student in question was uh, Yuan So um, even before she came to SOAS, uh, she had been a pioneering figure in Taiwan's uh, fair trade movement. Uh, and she came to SOAS to do an MA in food anthropology. Um, and we got to know each other a little bit. Um, but what really caught my attention was when just a couple of weeks after she uh, submitted her MA dissertation, um, she joined a, na a national parliamentary election. Um, and having studied mainstream parties, um, I know how long it takes in terms of preparation to win election in, uh, in Taiwan. Um, then um, a few months later, she went on to become the uh, co-convener of the Green Party um, uh, Taiwan. Um, and in uh, October of 2012, she sent me an email asking, would I share news about an Australian Greens research fund to do some research on uh, Taiwan's Green uh, parties? Rather than sharing it, I th uh, this news, I thought I'd give it a try and put together a research proposal together with um, a Taiwanese academic who'd previously been the Green Party's um, uh, leader and candidate, Pong Yunwei, who you saw in the cartoon in, uh, in the second um, uh, slide. So we, we set up a, um, uh, a couple of um, uh, focus groups in December of 2012, um, and immediately I was really hooked on this, uh, on this topic. These people were just so different from the mainstream politicians I'd been um, researching um, for uh, my uh, PhD. So idealistic, so passionate. Um, uh, there was so much kind of anger and, um, in these um, uh, in these focus uh, groups. Um, and that was the start of a project that's still uh, ongoing, um, uh, even, uh, even to this day. Um, but we've got to also have some academic reasons for looking at a party that often seems quite marginal. Um, at least my Taiwanese political science, my soci sociologist friends think it's a great topic, but my Taiwanese political science um, colleagues are not quite so convinced. So what makes this uh, party um, worth um, looking at? Well, I think there's a number of, uh, of reasons. It's often been a real pioneer when it comes to issue advocacy on things such as LG LGBTQ um, rights. It's the first party to talk about these kind of uh, issues. Uh, it's been a pioneer in the realm of environmental protection. Um, and if we look at the list of the party's candidates and leaders, it's a real um, A to Z in terms of the key social movement figures in Taiwan's uh, civil society in areas such as uh, gender equality, um, uh, anti-nuclear uh, advocacy. And Taiwan has made real achievements in these, uh, in these realms. First country to, in Asia to legalize same-sex marriage. Um, uh, it should be the first country, uh, it should uh, achieve uh, nuclear-free status um, in the next couple of, of years. If we look at the area of nomination, uh, it's also been a pioneer. The, uh, the first party to have 
uh, openly LGBT uh, candidates, the first party to have a female leader and the first party to have a fe male female co convener um, system. Um, and I'm just back from, uh, from field work in January, and in January, the party was the first one to have a um, transgender uh, candidate in, in Taiwan's uh, history. Uh, it's also Taiwan's most international uh, party, which is quite important if you think about how Taiwan is often excluded from international uh, organizations. In the international uh, green scene, it's a, a, a key player. It was a founder of the uh, Asia Pacific Greens and a founding member of Global Greens. Um, and Kelly Yen, who actually helped me in, in my opening um, uh, focus group, um, went on to be the convener of Asia Pacific Greens and the Global Greens between 2017 and uh, 2020. Okay, so how did the, um, um, let me move on now to the formation of the party. How did it actually um, uh, happen? So. The formation occurs uh, January 25th, um, 1996. Uh, and here we've got a couple of um, uh, headlines. Uh, social movement groups uh, yesterday created the Green Localized Fresh Party. Social movement groups split away from the DVP, which was the main opposition party, damaging the DVP's electoral prospects. Um, and it wasn't just um, environmental groups that came together to create this new political party. It included feminist, social welfare, indigenous rights, um, independent music, language rights uh, activists. And here we have the original uh, badge of the party, a, a sunflower with a green um, uh, background. Um, I, I, note, I noticed how I changed the uh, title slightly. Um, so in June of 1996, in the party's first member assembly, uh, it was stated that the Taiwan Green Party was the first Green Party in Asia. And um, other Asian countries had followed um, uh, Taiwan's example, including Mongolia and Thailand. But actually, they, this was incorrect. Um, a SOAS student pointed out to me um, uh, a couple of weeks ago that actually the Mongolian Green Party was formed first in March of 1990. Uh, uh, but at this point in time, we didn't yet have Asia-Pacific Greens or Global Greens. Um, so there wasn't that, say, that kind of awareness. Okay, so what was going on in Taiwan at the time this party is, is established? In many ways, it's a real historic moment in Taiwan's modern uh, history. Um, it was uh, in the run-up to the first direct presidential election in March of 1996, the moment that many countries recognised Taiwan as a full democracy. But it's also at the time when we have a cross-strait or China-Taiwan uh, crisis, the so-called 1995-1996 um, missile crisis. Um, I went back last week to look at the Times uh, archives, and Taiwan appears almost every day um, in, the, uh, in the Times during the run-up to this uh, election, as we see in this uh, front-page um, uh, news. Okay, so back to the formation of this um, political party. How did actually um, this what one member calls a beautiful accident, actually uh, occurs. The idea actually originates from people like many of you. Um, <laughs> a f a three master students were sitting around in a, um, uh, in a pub called Roxy uh, on, uh, on Heping Lu in, in Taipei. And suddenly and they came up with this, um, uh, this idea in spring of 1995. And here we've got a, um, a discount voucher for that. Um, for the Roxy. Now, unfortunately, it's now a, a, when I last went back, it was a, a piece of plot of empty land, so it's not usable anymore. Um, and they go around trying to persuade civil society groups to sign up to this idea of a, a um, civil society uh, political party. They spend almost a year with something like 100 separate meetings. Um, and here we have two of those three uh, students uh, 25 years um, uh, later. Uh, and they were, again, they, they were really helpful, uh, Hong Yicheng and, and Zhang, Zhang Qihuang. Um, so uh, a number of, there were a number of forces behind the creation of this uh, new party. There was a growing awareness of uh, European Green Parties at this, at this time. And, and um, works were being brought back to, uh, to Taiwan and then translated by some of these student uh, groups. Uh, the first gr uh, German Green visit to Taiwan occurred in the late 19. 
uh, 80s. Um, but it was also a time of very heightened uh, environmental activism. For example, uh, recall votes against pro-nuclear um, uh, legislators, anti, uh, local anti-nuclear uh, referendums. Uh, so uh, even though the parties fought in, in January 1996, the activism has been occurring for the last few years. But the thing that cro cropped up most in interviews about why the party was formed was a growing distrust and distance from the main opposition party, the, uh, the DVP. Uh, and, um, and here we, in the picture we see the, the two parties' flags being uh, merged. Um, and here we have a statement from the founding declaration. They've changed their strategy and, uh, and currently implemented the policy of total compromise with the existing structure in order to be elected to office. So they no longer, um, the civil society groups are no longer trusting the main opposition party. Okay, so how did the, this new, brand new political party do in its first uh, election? Actually, surprisingly um, well. Despite the fact that it's only um, uh, eight weeks old, or, um, it managed to win its first seat. Compare that to the England and Wales Green Party, which takes uh, 40 years to win its first uh, seat. Um, it's the, uh, in, and it has uh, competitive candidates. It's the fourth largest party in terms of vote share, and the main opposition party does see it as a threat. And this is despite having a tiny budget, a budget that's roughly the same as that of a single mainstream party uh, candidate. And here we've got a quote from a England and Wales Green Party figure who, who joins this campaign. And not only does she note the, uh, winning the election, but also an anti-nuclear referendum. So why does it manage to do so well in this first um, election? Um, one reason was to do with the, um, uh, the main opposition party, the Democratic Progressive Party, which was deeply divided in this uh, campaign over its presidential um, uh, candidate, uh, who was seen as, as extreme and narrowly focused on identity issues and neglecting social issues. So there was an opportunity there. A second um, uh, factor was what I called a masterpiece in nominating alternative diversity. The candidates um, were just so different from mainstream party uh, candidates. We had language rights uh, activist, um, a indigenous studies anthropologist. Uh, we had CEOs from um, Taiwan's number one independent records label, Crystal Records, the, uh, the label that brought uh, first released Tamintang and um, uh, Wu Bai, but also Joy Division and the Smiths was also on their, uh, on their label. Um, they also used very different campaigning <coughs> methods. Uh, for example, um, campaign, because they didn't have uh, much money, campaigning on bicycles, which sounds quite, um, which later became very fashionable. Um, the style of their campaign uh, rallies was also very, very different with indigenous and folk music performances, often linked to Crystal uh, Records. And, and here you've got my um, uh, co-author um, uh, here riding the, uh, the bike. Um, now, in this campaign, um, there was much focus on um, cross-strait relations because of the cross-strait tensions. So, but the Green Party did manage to get some of its own issues onto the agenda. And one of the ways it did this was through um, an a anti-nuclear referendum that was held in Taipei City on the same day as the uh, election. So again, um, they brought in their alternative um, uh, issues. But they couldn't really spend in the way that the mainstream parties uh, could. They couldn't buy ads uh, from TV or newspaper. So one of the ways that they got media attention was through stunts and confrontation. So one of the party founders would bring a group of his supporters to protest at the um, other party's presidential campaign headquarters or try to gatecrash their campaign events. And this generated quite a lot of free publicity. He continued to do this um, until, in a subsequent campaign, uh, he spent most of the campaign in hospital because he got... Um, so um, sometimes these events could turn a bit violent. Um, but the event that gained him the most attention was... Um, going out in a fishing boat into the Chinese mis missile test zone um, to um, uh, stand up to uh, the, these um, uh, Chinese missile uh, threats. Um, and this really got a lot of domestic 
but also international uh, tension. So there was a, I think there was a Guardian journalist going out with him in, the, uh, in, this, um, uh, in these boats. And this meant that for the first time, the international Green Parties were aware that Taiwan had a Green Party. Um, so very quickly we had uh, resolutions in support of the Taiwan Green Party, protesting against the Chinese missile threats. And we get um, um, uh, the European Greens agreeing to send two representatives to Taiwan just before the uh, election. Uh, th I think the, uh, the German Green member decided not to come in the end because she thought it was too dangerous because of the missile crisis. But Penny Kemp, who was a, a leader of the England and Wales Green Party, uh, she arrived in time um, and joined some of the campaign um, at events. Um, and this is one of the headlines from a, a England and Wales Green Party press release from after the election. Penny helps the Taiwan Greens to win uh, a seat. Um, and even though she was only there for a, um, a couple of weeks, she had a huge impact on some of these young Taiwan Green um, activists in terms of what it means to be a, um, a Green uh, Party. Um, and she al this was also the start of Taiwan's green diplomacy. Uh, we have the first Taiwan Green Party visit to the UK uh, in the summer of, uh, of that year. And she helps connect them to green parties in Australia and also other European uh, green parties. So that's a taste of the uh, Green Party's formation and its first relatively successful uh, election. Um, what about since the, the book has come out? Which The book came out in March of 20. Uh, 21. So since then, I've been working um, with a group of, um, uh, of Taiwanese uh, scholars, Peng Yewen, Wang Yehan, and Zhang Zhuqin, on some follow-up projects. We're working now on a Chinese version of the book. Not a translation, but a rewritten version. Uh, in all three cases, my co-authors are former party leaders and candidates from different periods in the party's um, uh, history. Um, one of the uh, uh, highlights of our subsequent um, uh, project has been speaking at the Global Greens Congress in um, uh, uh, June of uh, 2023. Um, and that was when I, I, I um, that was my connection to Rwanda in this, uh, having breakfast with the, um, uh, the president of the Rwandan uh, Green Party, uh, Frank Hebenezer, which was, I, 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 it was breakfast, so I, I, I wasn't expecting to have this photo opportunity. <laughs> okay, so lastly, um, uh, I've just got to say a few words of thanks to a few people. Um, I've got to say a big thanks to um, my parents, um, Georgie and Russell uh, Fell, particularly for taking me to, and my brother to live in China as, uh, for a couple of years in the early 1980s. That had a huge impact on my interest in East Asian politics. Um, secondly, I've got to say a big thanks to, um, uh, to Jewel uh, Law, uh, my wife, who's <coughs> accompanied me on... Uh, all these fieldwork trips um, for this, this uh, project, even having a, a hand at um, election campaigning, helping out the, uh, the Green Party, um, and uh, uh, checking the, uh, um, the final manuscript. Often, when I was writing draft chapters, I would give them to Jewel, and when I heard laughter in the, in the next room, I knew I'd probably got the tone uh, right. Um, I also um, want to say a big thanks to um, Caldecott Walking uh, uh, Football, which... Um, often as academics we struggle with writer's block um, and I should have I planned to write the book in 2016 but I just didn't know how to start I didn't know that, couldn't work out the structure so I did something easier um, and then I joined Caldecott Walking Football in September of 2019 um, and then within um, a couple of weeks I'd got the plan I had the structure uh, I, um, and I had my most productive writing period in my whole life um, in um, that year um, uh, and I think um, academic life can be really hard in terms, mentally it can be really tough um, um, it's not just um, drinking beer uh, in field work um, and I think that uh, uh, it, it, although I should say that's been one of the, the differences between movement party studies and mainstream party studies there's been a lot more beer with the Taiwan uh, Greens um, but um, getting through the COVID year, I think um, fo football really helped so, uh, so much. Um, and um, I've also got to say a big word of thanks to, uh, to Bob Ash and my, and my Taiwan Studies Centre uh, team, uh, BU, uh, Max and, and Chung Yu. I think without you, we couldn't have achieved this, um, the amazing things we've achieved over the last 
25 um, uh, years. And um, um, uh, thanks for going along with my kind of enthusiasm. And lastly, I've got to say a big thanks to the Taiwan Greens um, who have shared their stories with me over the last uh, 15 uh, years. Many of them actually have actually come to SOAS to talk, usually about their academic research or about their um, activism. This is the Taiwan Greens coming to speak at the... This is in the KLT in 2017. So I've got to say a big thanks to them for their help, but also for their huge sacrifices in, uh, t towards the cause of environmental, but also gender and social justice. Uh, I think what they've achieved, I think, is really quite uh, remarkable. Um, and, uh, and that's where I'd like to, uh, to finish. Um, and maybe I should invite uh, Phil back, and maybe we should take a joint questions. Yeah, come on.